in 24 different countries and have 44 different members, um, all united to promote progressive taxation systems and see the extent to which we can advocate for policies that are curbing illicit financial flows. So for this particular session, um, we were really excited to delve a little bit more into the theme um, of, of this year's ANCTAD meeting, which is from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all. Um, as we are all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated both of these issues, inequality, vulnerability, poverty, um, both within as well as amongst countries. Um, for this particular session, we're going to be focusing specifically on the issue of inequalities between countries, with a focus on the discrepancy um, between the global north and the global south. To help us delve into this conversation, I have three incredible speakers who will be joining um, us and helping us explore the conversation. Um, I have Ms. Pooja Ranga Prasad. I have been practicing your last name, Pooja, so I hope I said that correct. Um, and so Pooja is um, Director of Policy and Advocacy Financing for Development um, with the Society for International Development. Um, and then you also have Mr. Alvin Mosioma, who is the Executive Director for Tax, Tax Justice Network Africa. And then lastly, we also then have Ms. Stella Agara. Um, she is the e Economic Justice and Climate Action Lead from Akina Mamawa, Africa, um, both, not both, but all of whom will be giving us different perspectives into this conversation today. So we're going to kick it off um, with having uh, Pooja provide a little bit of context uh, with regards to some of the systematic issues um, that undergird the inequality that we're seeing um, amongst countries. I think particularly with the focus, like I said earlier, um, amongst the global north and the global south. Um, Puja plays a very key role in coordinating um, the civil society forum for financing development and a lot of the issues that um, the conversations that happen within that space um, really um, contribute to the understanding of these systematic issues. So Puja, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, you've got about 10, maximum 15 minutes to explore this component of the conversation um, and then we'll go on the with the rest of the of, of the discussion. So thanks, Pooja, over to you. Thank you so much, Chennai, and a warm thanks for the invitation. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I think also just an incredibly timely topic to be discussing, um, of course, on the sidelines of UNCTAD 15. Um, as you mentioned, um, we coordinate the Civil Society Financing for Development Group. And for those who may not be aware, it's an open civil society platform uh, of several hundreds of organizations and networks from around the world that are interested and engaged in the UN's FFP process. Um, and um, what I want to do with this, maybe this conversation is actually to locate both the FFP process and the conversation and UNCTAD's role within the right to development framework. Um, and I think one of the one of the reflections I think lately that many of us that have I think talking been talking about is the fact that the whole right to development conversation has really fallen in prominence over the last couple of decades. Um, and um, even within the Geneva space, there's a lot of reflections on how, for instance, while UNCTAD's work has fallen in prominence in this kind of right to development framework, um, Human Rights Council um, has risen in prominence. And in many ways, it's become very disconnected, the human rights conversation and the right to development conversation. Um, and the right to development conversation, um, which is, of course, with the Declaration on Right to Development, which was adopted in 1986, is very much rooted in addressing this global north-south development divide um, and you know one of the commitments in this declaration is the fact that states have the primary responsibility for creating both national as well as the international conditions that are favorable to realize the right to development um, and they have a duty to cooperate with each other to eliminate obstacles to development. And a key part of what their duties are that's that's laid out in this declaration is is to promote a new international economic order that's based on sovereign equality, interdependence, mutual interest, and cooperation. 
um, all towards the realization of human rights. So I think that's really the center thing where we need to promote a new international economic order that has kind of fallen off the agenda, um, I think, over the last couple of decades, where we need to locate both the important role that UNCTAD has and the mandate of UNCTAD where it needs to be strong, as well as the financing for development conversation and process. Um, I mean, the FFT process historically has been really rooted in this framework because it was pushed by developing countries. Um, the first conference happened in 2002, um, and it was really a push by developing countries to recover the voice of the United Nations, which has a core mandate um, on issues of global finance and economy, but over the years has been sidelined by undemocratic forums and bodies which are dominated by global north countries such as world bank imf and oecd um, and i know we'll hear a little bit more about the gender dimensions uh, from from uh, one of the other speakers but it's also where the gender conversation also needs to be located much more prominently which is within this macroeconomic framework um, which fails to recognize unpaid domestic and care work which provides this huge subsidy to the global economy um, and of course continues to be uh, severely underestimated in these conversations and frameworks. Um, and of course we can have, you know, really a long conversation about the labels of North and South and, you know, is South really a monolith and, you know, and those are very important conversations, but, you know, even if we were to keep it broad for, for the purpose of this conversation, the current crisis has really exposed this divide much more, even for those who might want to say it doesn't exist as much anymore. We've seen, you know, while on the one hand, Global North has been able to deploy these massive stimulus packages and, you know, vaccines to the point of hoarding vaccines, the Global South is, of course, confronted with vaccine apartheid, unbearable restrictions on their policy and fiscal space to actually respond to the crisis due to illicit financial flows, unfair trade and investment regimes, unsustainable debt burdens, and policy conditionalities. Um, so really, the current global economic order is the problem. Um, and there's really a need to bring the global economy and finance back into democratic accountability rather than being these mechanisms that extracts wealth, exploits labor, and amplifies inequalities, especially gender inequalities. So uh, the key priority for the United Nations uh, is decolonizing the global economy, um, something that it started with doing in 1945. And you know, when we look at the global economy, the decolonization project isn't over, far from it. Um, and again, it needs to come back to the right to development, I think, framework. And there needs to be, a, of course, a recognition that these are issues, when we talk about these global systemic issues, they're issues that cannot be addressed purely at the national or regional level. Um, and this is why it requires an ambitious response uh, under the auspices of the UN, which remains the only place where countries of the global south are at the table with equal voice and vote. Um, and I think this is also something even within civil society, um, there is remains, I think, a gap on how we how we address it, because on the one hand, there's a lot of work really where we think about how do we regionalize the agenda, how do we localize and, you know, talk about these issues. The question I think where there's still a gap is how do we make the case for why the global matters to the regional and national visions of development and transformational strategies? Why does it matter to have this new international economic order that's democratic and inclusive and has the global south at the table? And why is that relevant to the visions that we have in our countries and in our regions in the global south. And I think when we ask that question, there's still much more work to be done, I think, even, even within civil society to really address those gaps. Um, so of course, I mean, as civil society, we've of course been calling for a follow-up FFT conference at the UN, um, which really moves towards this new global economic architecture that works for people and the planet and is centered on principles of human rights gender equality and socioeconomic and ecological justice. Um, and of course, this is also where UNCTAD's mandate is really critical uh, because of the unique role of UNCTAD, which is at the intersection of trade, finance, and development. This is where we want the kind of normative 
and policy analysis uh, around these systemic impediments uh, to the development of the global south. Um, and so in order to really advance the vision of that socioeconomic transformation um, and the importance of uh, democratization of global economic governance, it's really critical that UNCTAD has a strong mandate that really looks at sort of the systemic determinants of debt, for example, um, as well as you know the, the debt architecture reforms that are needed. Um, Again, looking at you know, issues of illicit financial flows, not just measuring, but also the policy analysis that is so important and providing kind of the normative support uh, for discussions between governments, um, including really looking at you know, taxation of the digitalized economy, the implications of the measures being discussed right now on developing countries, the development impacts of the current trade and investment frameworks, um, particularly the conversation now around you know, the intellectual property rights and COVID vaccines and medicines and so on, the need for a you know, moratorium on investor state dispute settlement cases where corporations are suing so many governments around the world, particularly from the global south and billions of, of dollars uh, that are being paid to these corporations even during this pandemic now as a result, um, the need to much more critically challenge this private finance first approach to financing development that has really taken over the SDG agenda and in the name of financing SDG agenda we've moved away again from talking about these systemic issues to very simplistic private finance will fix everything approach so so again the need for an UNCTAD mandate that really critically analyzes um, these issues um, looking at you know the technology divide between the north and the south once again you know a systemic analysis of this and the need for democratic governance of technology and digitalization as well um, and then of course all of the other systemic issues related to the international financial architecture the need for kind of regulatory interventions that are needed so um, so this is I mean I, I know I don't have a lot of time so I'll stop there but that's really kind of the vision of I think what we need UNCRAD to do how we look at the FFT conversation and it's very much within the right to development framework and, and the North-South divide. Uh, happy to take questions at the end of it. Thanks, Janai. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pooja. I think thank you so much for within that short time frame being able to cover so much um, about the historical context, right, that undergirds this conversation, um, what the role of the UN should be. Um, some of the systemic issues that exist that are exacerbating this current crisis. Um, and like you said, um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, if anything, has actually further exposed um, you know, the, the, the inequality that exists. And, and this was seen very much by you know, the, 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 the level of responsiveness that countries were able to give in, in, in response to the crisis. And, and now, like you also mentioned, you know, this conversation about vaccine apartheid and vaccine equity, right, um, in, in response to that. So, so thank you so much for providing that, that context. Really, really useful. And definitely we'll come back to you with some questions. So what we're going to do now is um, hone it in a little bit more. So you mentioned the conversation around uh, private financing, right? Um, and a lot of the work that we do at TJNA um, is development financing um, and, and trying to find the most sustainable way for countries in the global south to be able to finance their development um, in a way that centers the interest of their own citizenry. So I'm now going to hand over um, to Alvin, um, who I mentioned earlier as the executive director of TJNA, um, to, to help us, I think, dig deeper into that conversation a little bit more. So Alvin, over to you. Um, you have about 10, 15 minutes as well. Thanks, Alvin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chennai uh, and, and, and uh, Puja for that, I think very, very brilliant uh, opening um, submission. There's really very little uh, <laughs> to that. We can actually go straight to Q&A or to have a conversation, but allow me please to add a few, a few things. I think one of the things just um, that jumps out of what Puja was saying is about this question about decolonizing global economy. And what this means that the conversation we need to have is not necessarily a technical conversation but a political conversation. And if there's anything that underscores that more is what we have seen in the different crises that, that, um, that, um, that we have witnessed, be the debt crisis, the financial crisis, uh, now the COVID crisis, and how different countries um, and regions have responded and how the global community has responded. And that basically what you see out of that is 
the volume of, 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 of this session could not be more timely. The North divide, North South divide is not an accident. I, I think it's, 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 it's a deliberate, historical, um, geopolitical um, framing that needs to be challenged as such. Um, when we see it is, it is about world's power uh, and who has the resources to, to uh, determine uh, the decisions and who are, who, who are the decision makers and who are bearing the brunt of, uh, of those decisions. We have seen historically, I've been, I've been part of the UNCTAD conversation uh, since I think, um, I say that you're gonna know how old I am. This is, I think, my, my fourth uh, UNCTAD conversation that I've been involved in. And considering that it happens every four years, then you can see how historical even that, <laughs> that point is. And, and it's get frustrating how, we have to keep hammering on and on about the importance of protecting the UNCTAD mandate. And every four years, we are in the same space, uh, underscoring the importance um, and the legitimacy uh, or the, the importance of, uh, of protecting the UNCTAD mandate as uh, the institution that has both the legitimacy, the credibility, to provide uh, policy options and reforms on the international financial architecture that is actually centered around the challenges and the perspectives um, of developing countries, of the people that, that have been marginalized and, and, and are vulnerable. So we feel sometimes that we are going full circle, uh, particularly for, for, for many developing countries. We are almost where we were in the early 80s, where um, we were looking at finding um, private uh, uh, solutions to public problems. The point that uh, uh, Puja mentioned of, of, of the emergence of PPPs, the structural um, adjustment that many of our countries are, the World Bank and the IMF are back on the driver's seat in terms of the policy making in many of our countries coming up with different um, uh, policy um, um, quote unquote recommendations on, on, on this basis money is given to our government that are really Exacerbating the already the already the already existing inequality. So I think when we when we come back to the question of of, of this north south divide, I think the bigger question that in my sense we need to ask ourselves is that we are in a situation where um, developing countries should actually be speaking in one voice, and and the, and the G seventy seven has come out very strongly uh, saying that uh, we need to challenge, we need to ensure that. Uh, uh, global problems, solutions to global problems are found in spaces that have the legitimacy uh, to find those solutions. You cannot expect, I think it is, it is full, full heartedly to expect um, fair solutions from an institution that is deeply flawed or, or institutions and forums that are lack political uh, democratic um, Credibility and and this is this is not just theory. We see solutions that are emerging, particularly when it comes to development finance from the OECD. You look at the so-called pillar one and the pillar two on how global profits should be shared. Um, the point about, for example, when you look at the digital economy, the solutions that were being provided were solutions that were actually benefiting um, the rich countries. When you look at the, the ongoing conversation around the, around the to global minimum tax, the same thing, and this is not an accident because when you have institutions that were, have been established to protect the interest of those that have power, it is obvious that you expect that the solutions that will come out of them will be to their own interest. And so when we are calling for the strengthening of the UN, when we are calling for the protection of the UNCTAD mandate, the foundation, the core foundation of this is that this is the only way we can contribute to um, ensuring that there's a fair and equitable distribution of, of global goods, of global public goods. And there's no any other alternative to this. I mean, there are, we have seen efforts, particularly by the rich countries, to already delegitimize even the few, we, even the few institutions that exist uh, either within the UN or within the, within, within, within UNCTA to try and try and delegitimize this kind of institution because that's the only way they can continue um, centralizing power and, and ensuring that the outcomes of, of, of those decisions or solutions to those what are perceived to be global, 
global problems are ones that are, in, are, are driven by, by, by short term and, and, and short term and also by, by, by self interest. So I think that as civil society organizations, um, but also as countries of the developing South, um, they strengthen numbers. And, and I'm, I'm very happy, for example, that uh, countries such as Kenya. Uh, and Nigeria came out very strongly to say, no, we, we don't buy into these solutions. So the, the for Africa, we have teamed up together with uh, other, other regional organizations to actually start a campaign that is calling for the rejection of the global deal uh, because this deal has developing countries at the short end of the stick. And, and, and I think consolidating uh, and the, the numbers and making this and this bringing back to my very final submission is that we need to make this a political conversation because sometimes what we see again is that the, 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 the rich countries have a have a that that kind of um, they have perfected in hiding behind technicalities behind behind hiding in technical conversations as a way of of, of exclusion, of, of a way of saying that you need, you can't be on the table because you don't understand these complex matters. So I think that the, the responsibility we have as, as activists in this space is really to make this a political conversation and mobilize. And I'm happy to see across the world, uh, people are standing up and saying um, no to this uh, particular the, the, the G7 deal, but even more strongly saying that we need to delegitimize. That's the thing, the, the, the final point, we need to legitimize these institutions that have taken upon themselves to be the global, uh, the global resetters and push those decisions to those spaces where uh, they were actually meant to establish to be uh, the space that were established to serve those global public interests. I'll stop there, Chennai, and thanks, thanks again for, for this opportunity. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alvin. Um, I think, like I said, perfect segue from what I think Pooja said um, in terms of really buttressing uh, the comments that she had raised. But, but indicating that the current situation within which we find ourselves is not accidental, it is deliberate and it is systematic. Um, and that one of the key ways to address that um, is by, like you said, strength in numbers, right? Coordinating the way in which we approach, uh, the way we tackle um, the, the system that is perpetuating um, you know, the poverty and inequality that we're seeing um, both within as well as amongst, amongst countries. Um, I am really excited to, to see that Stella has managed to join us. Um, and Stella, I could see you vigorously nodding your head as, as Alvin was speaking. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear what it is that you most that most resonated with you um, when Alvin was speaking. Um, but I think also, like I had already had a conversation with you, is that you know when we're having these conversations about poverty and inequality, right? It's often you know, women, marginalized communities that are most negatively affected by this. So I think I'm going to ask you to do two things. What most resonated with you, I think, based off of what, what you heard, what were you nodding your head about? But also, I think I think really take us to, you know, the individual, the people that are most harmed by the system that is being perpetuated by the current um, way of working. Thanks, Stella. Thank you so much, Chennai, and an apology for coming in late. I totally mixed up the times. I thought I had 30 minutes to lounge as I was waiting for this meeting. My very sincere apologies. But I'm glad that I caught uh, Alvin just when he was starting his presentation. And I'm, uh, it's, it's such a sad thing that I missed Puja's presentation, but I know I'll, I've picked up a bit of tidbits from the responses that were given by Alvin. I, I am extremely grateful that you brought uh, uh, me into this conversation and especially the aspect that you want me to represent here. And the reason why I'm excited is because sometimes the groups that I'm about to speak for are forgotten in this conversation and forgotten because there are too many other aspects to speak about when you're discussing inequality between the global north and the global south. So women, youth, people with disabilities sometimes fall within, uh, between the cracks as you're trying to muscle your way into, you know, even negotiating for, for alternate um, growth uh, models and, and, and development systems that would actually be more inclusive. However, the reason why I was nodding as, as Alvin was speaking is because he's partly speaking, actually not partly, he's actually speaking my language. And, and I was nodding because he has alluded to, to even the, the ideas of, of determining, or who, rather who determines the philosophy of what, you know, growth is who determines the conversation and what um, um, a, a well-performing economy is about, you know, who is having the conversations or deciding whether we are going to continue using the oil dollar in this world or, or you know, who's deciding 
where the resources go to for, for the basic services that are actually needed for, for our communities to actually begin en enjoying um, inclusive development. So for me, that's, that's one of the things I was nodding my head about. The second has got to do with the fact that um, uh, uh, he has, Alvin has delved into the conversation about uh, um, uh, designing models that work uh, 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 for us, and especially uh, taking time to think through some of those models and and beginning to influence conversations that 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 um, um, make that happen. Indeed, Alvin, if you have been in a space for a very long time, sometimes you start worrying that maybe there's nothing new you're bringing, or maybe your voice is not being heard. But for me, <laughs> I, 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 I hear you, Stella. My experience in 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 some of these conversations is is that. Most of these problems that you're dealing with are not problems that are resolved in a short time. And the longer you're there sometimes actually enables you to be able to have institutional memory about what needs to change, what needs to be done along the way, and, 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 and maybe even reminding people about, you know, the true north when, when they're lost and they're not, no longer sure what they want to talk about. It becomes very easy to also get absorbed into the capitalist agenda that eventually brought us to a place where we can talk about a global north and a global south. But having said that, um, the last uh, thing that I picked up from Alvin's presentation is the fact that he, uh, we, we, we rarely ask ourselves who's, who is speaking about the problem, who is talking about it, who is pointing out that, that there is a problem. And, and when they're talking about the problem, do they get to represent all the, all the voices that may not necessarily find their way, for example, into an unted conversation? Do they get to represent all the voices that um, do not find their way into mainstream conversations about uh, addressing inequality between the global north and the south. Have we tried to break down this conversation in a manner that will be understood by those groups of people? Uh, at Akinamama Africa, we work uh, with women and, 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 and lots of young women. And, and part, of, part of the problem is that we have realized in all our trainings that young women sometimes actually don't even appreciate that there's a problem. So you have to start from actually breaking it down to them and getting them to understand that there is a problem in the first place, that, that, that some of the, the experiences that they have are actually not normal and that they, they need to be a part of the conversations to, to challenge the, the status quo. Um, we also find that a lot of the times they do not have um, an appreciation of, of the systems. And, and, and I think Puja must have alluded to some of the things I'm going to mention even as I say this, some of the systems that have brought them to a place where one, they don't know, and, and, and the little they know, the language that has been used to communicate it is, is actually not a language that they understand. And number three, the systems that have actually brought them to a place where they may have to succumb until a point when they come to understand. So for me, uh, I'm, I'm not just looking at inequalities between the global north and the global south, I'm looking at inequalities even um, 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 between ages, you know, of, 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 of of people that younger people have, a, have bear more of the brunt of of of, uh, of some of the inequalities that we have. Women carry a huge burden, especially because of, of of the unpaid care work and the contribution they make to our economies. And yet, these are the group of people who actually do not get to understand these conversations uh, um, well. Some of the attempts we make to do is to begin having those conversations with them, and then work with them in visioning what an alternative development model would be like what an alternative system would look like. Because for us, it's extremely important that we demystify colonialism, that we demystify neoliberalism and, and the baggage that is, it's, it's carrying over. I also saying that we are proposing solutions that are different. And those solutions are solutions that actually are feminist. So feminist alternatives to, to growth models, fem, feminist alternatives to development. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, feminism uh, and uh, feminism actually embraces inclusion, embraces participation of all groups would actually then promote an opportunity for women to be on the table, for women to be included in conversations, but not just to be included. For even the, the, the data that we are collecting to determine to make decisions to incorporate variables that actually impact on the lives of women and one of the active proposals that we're making is the is, is the the you and i think chennai we've had a conversation about this before is even the the uh, the application of growth models that do not just you know uh, elevate gdp as 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 the measure for for growth but beginning to look at models that will actually begin uh, checking or collecting data 
on aspects that actually do affect women or aspects that are actually linked to women and that are very critical to development. You know, what contribution does, does, does child care make into the economy? What contribution does even the ironing of that shirt that, that the, uh, uh, the man of the home is going to wear to go to work make into the economy? And going into the integrity of all those, computing that and making sure that then those are considered. What uh, is the impact of um, uh, infant mortality, for example, to the economy? What, what happiness indicators can we look at to make sure that even as we are talking about dignity, what kind of dignity is enjoyed in the, in the global north? What kind of dignity is enjoyed in the global south? What do we think is dignity? Does a woman in, in, in Africa know that there's a woman in, in, in Europe, for example, who has access to free medical care, free maternity, you know, um, um, whatever form of birth they want, you know, if they're unable to give birth, does a woman in Africa know that there's a woman out there who has options that are paid for by the state? And yet here they need to desperately look, look, look for, for those options. Um, and, and, and for me, that info, the proliferation of that information actually helps to get as many people as possible to understand the problem. But most importantly, it begins to get these voices on the table to build the constituency that Alvin was talking about, mobilization of, of agency, to begin pushing these conversations, to begin asking questions, to begin challenging the, 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 the philosophy that I began with that seems almost like it's cast in stone, people believing that the economy is the kind of greed that we have promoted in this uh, world now is not sustainable. It is not sustainable. There's no possibility that we can continue like this and have all of us living in the same space. So beginning to, to, to have conversations where we are no longer thinking about amassing wealth to protect ourselves from God knows what enemy that it is we are trying to protect ourselves from, but begin to think about how we can grow together, how we can um, ensure that we, we maintain a good treasury for the social protection of every individual and not just the individuals who are, who are from the global north, for those who are benefiting. So now I keep giving this example in every conversation I've held, that during the COVID situation, we had... Um, um, welfare that was being given to the needy citizens in Kenya. And I think uh, every week there are women in the, in the, in the uh, informal settlements who are receiving $10 a day, uh, $10 a week as, as welfare from the government support to back them up because of the lockdown. But I also have information from, from a few um, um, billionaires in the US who happen to be my friends who say they receive checks massive checks that they did not need. And so they didn't know what to do with the money. If they had a way of, of giving back the money, they would have sent it back to the government because they didn't need it. And, and for them, the check was about uh, $1,000. I mean, I don't need to tell you any further stories about this to know that even at the, at the point of trouble, the, the amount of resources given to back up these groups of people is, is, is there's disparity in the same. Now with $10, a woman in Africa is supposed to feed their home and still maintain the health care of the family under a pandemic situation compared to the person who has received a check of $1,000. And so th th those kinds of disparities just continue to um, increase the gap between the, the, the woman in the global north and the woman in the global south. And, and some of, some of, some of the, the, the strategies that have been used to continue putting the most um, biggest minorities in oppression is by ensuring that the disparities continue to grow even between the same groups. So that with the enmity, you don't manage to bring the kind of agency that is needed. But for me, I'm in full agreement that there's need for agency, there's need for urgency, there's need for us to speak truth, absolute truth to power, because sometimes we find ourselves trying to be politically correct, and unfortunately, there's nothing it's doing for us. Um, uh, they need to speak truth to power, they need to ensure that there's knowledge being generated continuously, even knowledge about the areas that have not been checked. I'm glad we are already beginning to document the value of unpaid care work. I'm glad that you're already beginning to document the experience of, 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 um, of the, the working woman in, in, in the United States of America who doesn't get to enjoy you know, maternity and what that means for them. 
uh, and even drawing the lines to show that for women, it's a different level of marginalization. And sometimes that marginalization cuts across the, the global, north, global, south um, uh, spectrum and actually goes beyond when it comes to issues of, 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 of care work and, and the likes. So for me, um, I think that's 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 what I would really emphasize: agency, agency, and and uh, and knowledge development, proliferation of knowledge, and of course, challenging the status quo, rethinking the models, rethinking the philosophy, designing new solutions, and and proliferating those solutions so that as a, as we're having conversations about trade, about exchange equality then becomes an, a, an intrinsic component of the conversation and not a thing that we think about after the system that has been designed has failed. Awesome, thank you so much, Stella. I love your, your I think your, your wisdom around so many of these issues. I, I think so, so important to ensure that they are centralized within, within these conversations. Um, okay, so we have, if I take a look at my watch, just over 10 minutes, 13 minutes, um, to, to have Q and A. Um, so if you're watching on the live stream, please go ahead um, and post any questions. I believe there should be a Slido section um, and I will receive those questions and be able to, to pose them um, to any of the, the speakers that are, that are on the panel. So please go ahead, put them in there. And then as soon as I get them, I will read them out and pose them to, to the different candidates that we have today. Um, so I think what I'm going to do as we're waiting for those questions um, is just kind of, I think, dig a little bit deeper into what's already been shared um, by, by Alvin, Pooja, as well as Stella, um, and, and then see where, I guess, the conversation takes us. Um, so Pooja, I wanted to, to maybe go back to you. So I, you used a phrase, I think, that really struck with me about the need for us to decolonize the global economy, right? Like I mentioned, you, you took us back and gave us a historical perspective around what, how it is we got to where we are and you know, the, the mandate that the UN was supposed to um, undertake to addressing those issues. I'm curious to know to what extent you feel that there has been a certain level of decolonization. There has been progress, if any, um, in, in this direction, because we're still having this conversation today. Um, but are we having it from the space we were having it when the conversation started? Thanks, Pooja. Yeah, I think Alvin kind of alluded to it where, I mean, this is really um, a political, um, it's really a political struggle. And a lot of these issues, when we talk about global finance and economy, I think part of the strategy has been um, to really get down into these very technical rabbit holes and really disempower what needs to happen really politically and the engagement that needs to happen politically. And so, um, so yeah, I was just reading Alvin's chat. Um, so yes, I mean, I think in many ways, this is the big challenge today uh, to bring back this conversation and to politicize this conversation and to mobilize politically around this conversation um, and to really challenge, as Alvin said, this, um, this push to make this about a, this very technocratic kind of debates and conversations and um, and really challenge um, and reject that, as Alvin says, um, and really move move this in much more political uh, in much more political lines. Um, so yeah, so no, this is this has been uh, politically, as I mentioned, over the last couple of decades. I think that's why really has you know fallen in prominence. Um, and these these have not, not been a coincidence. These have been the active political choices that has led to this. And so I think part of our work as civil society now is. To really mobilize and and speak to what the political implications are of this, um, and and steering away from not not saying the technical is not important, but uh, but really at the same time recognizing that the struggle is actually political at the heart. Um, and and as Alvin gave this wonderful example of the tax campaign that PJNA and others are leading on is really a good way uh, to do that because. Uh, I mean, the tax world is this. I mean, full of technical <laughs> landmines. If you wish to, if you wish to engage, um, but really, our work is to go back to the politics of it and agitate and say, well, we reject this, um, and there's a different political vision we want our governments to pursue. So, 
Yeah, I'm sure Alvin and Stella have more to add on this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But I think Alvin, I'd, I'd be keen to hear some of your thoughts on that. But I think in addition to that, I'd be curious to hear. So one of the points that you made that I sort of um, reiterated when I before Stella spoke was 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 that there is strength in numbers, right? And then you spoke to this campaign, of course, that you know a lot of us as civil societies are, are wanting to engage in, particularly in response to this global minimum tax. Um, but, you know, a level higher when you're talking about the need to coordinate different actors to be speaking with the same voice. In response to this G7, we have seen completely uncoordinated reactions and responses from the global south, right? So I'd be curious to, to hear your, your responses as well about um, what we need to do to address that particular situation, right, um, as well, because I think it also contributes, I think, to the point that you're making about strength in numbers. Thanks, Alvin. Thanks. I mean, I think if there is one thing, um, I will use the word the beast. If there's one thing the beast has perfected in is in terms of is reinventing and re-engineering itself. So you can never beat the system in their own language and in their own territory. And their own territory is hiding in technical, in technospeak. Um, OECD has the best brains when it comes to transfer pricing, when it comes to, I don't know, all these technical things. So trying to be in that or keep our, our fights in those terrains, we will lose. Because the fundamental question, I think that's the point also Stella was making, the fundamental question is really political. Um, we have seen we were pushing saying OECD is a club of the rich. What did they do? They created the inclusive framework. Even you stole our language and said, "Okay, we now have a, a framework that is inclusive." Um, when uh, when we were saying that OECD is exclusive, they said, "No, we'll create a global forum and we'll use the word global." So we are we are all around the table and let's 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 now kind of um, find find solutions together. So I think really. Um, the, 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 and this is not just in the area of tax. We saw this uh, for, for, for those of us who are in the debt movement. Um, if there are lessons that we draw uh, from the whole conversation was that we, we are not going to negotiate the text on the, on the debt because we believe that this debt is illegitimate. It's odious. So it was that simple. Uh, we, we, are, we are calling for a summary cancellation. You can find the right text to write into that, but the ultimate outcome we want to see is that those, those debts are, are cancelled. There was some success, and I think the success, if we, if we were to learn from uh, previous economic justice uh, movements and, and, and struggles and battles, it's really in the, in the terrain of, of political um, uh, campaigning that, that, that we succeed. And I think that's what there is a temptation, of course, uh, among us uh, as we delve deeper into this, into, into the tax technology. There's that temptation, of course, um, of, of getting more into, into the technical. And, and, I'm, and I'm not saying we should not be reading text. I'm not saying we should not um, be exposing ourselves to, 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 to the nitty gritties of the matter. But I think it is using that and translating those into political um, statements and political conversation. I think that's what the best, best value we as, as civil society activists can do is, is understand what the issues are. Um, being invited to speak in transfer pricing conversations um, by the big companies, the KP. I've never studied transfer pricing, but I know that it's flawed. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it's flawed from the foundation in terms of how you imagine uh, you're measuring trade between two companies. And, and you don't need to have a master's in that to be able to convince someone that, that that's a flawed way of, 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 of um, of, of, of measuring relationship between two related companies. So I think our success really, and that's the, I think the takeaway we can be able to have is really how do we pick up this perceived um, technical languages, repackage them and package them that they make political sense. And when they do that, we can be able to get people to mobilize around them, to push their leaders, to be able to, because our leaders act Political will is manufactured. It, it doesn't exist in the thin air. It, it has to be manufactured. It is manufactured through pressure on, on, on our political elite. And it can only happen when we manage to translate these um, apparently technical issues into um, digestible uh, political conversations. And, and, and when it comes to, um, to the area of, of, of financing or financing resources, um, 
it, I think, uh, again, it is the biggest challenge. And I think Puja uh, made that move. Historically, the, the founding of the UN, the founding of UNCTAD, the founding of the FFP process have all been on the backdrop of recognizing that there's an imbalance in power. There's an imbalance in power, and, and that imbalance is resulting, is leading to outcomes that are, 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 are resulting to where the money is coming from and where the money is going. Therefore, we need to create systems where those that are being affected, those that are bearing the brunt of those decisions also have a say in terms of how those global decisions are made. And that, I think, that's really the, the main campaign we have around protecting the, the UNCTAD mandate. It's not because we love UNCTAD so much, or we, it's because that is the most effective space. And as Puja was saying, the intersection between um, finance and trade and, 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 and related issues of development that's the space that those conversations can happen, informed from the interests um, uh, and perspectives at the South and, and, and as civil society activists or as actors in this space, I think the power lies in how best uh, we organize, how best we come together, recognize that the uh, uh, Philippines has more much in common with, uh, with, 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 with Kenya than we probably think and joining forces at, at, at that cause the South-South collaboration, I think, is, is one of the most stronger ways that, that uh, we can be able to do this, work, working with our colleagues in Latin America, in Asia, and, and, and pressuring our government and telling them, we, we, we have your back. We have your back in this negotiation tables, um, and we are watching the decisions that we are making. That, I think, is also important that we, we are conscious of the pressure you are in as, as governments, but we are also uh, watching uh, the decisions we make and that, how those decisions impact on the day-to-day -day life. The examples that uh, that Stella Stella was mentioning that these these decisions that are made in New York on Geneva have a yeah. direct bearing to that uh, uh, woman in, um, in in some town in in my own small town in Kisi. So I think making those connections and using that as a foundation to mobilize and 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 I'll finalize by quoting one of my. Uh, one of my heroes, um, Tajuddin Abdurrahim, when he said we should stop organizing and let's organize. And I think that's the power we have as a, a civil society activist. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alvin. Um, it's interesting, you know, when you talk about um, the way in which um, they are trying to, um, what's that word? It's not to see. I always have words stuck in my head and then I forget what they mean, but almost. You had to capture the language, really. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> and to capture the conversation and, and then hide it behind us. Sorry, do you have it? Co-op. Co yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so and, and, and the reason I, I find that really interesting is because on a personal note, um, my mother and all my sisters are accountants um, and all understand the tech, the technical components of tax and, and, I, you know, and, and all of that. And they have no idea what on earth it is that I'm doing when I tell them that I also work in the same field, right? Um, just because there's such a dissonance between, you know, the political conversation related to tax and, and, and the technical. Um, and so maybe, Stella, as, as, as we wrap up, um, what, what I'm really, really curious to know is because you mentioned that a lot of the work that you're doing um, is sort of demystifying, right, this, this conversation as you engage with rights holders. I'd be keen to know how is that going? Um, you know, what, what are some of the practical ways that you are engaging with people on the ground, with women on the ground, particularly, right? Um, to get them to see the need to participate and be interested in these conversations. Um, and then I think from there, probably I would ask you if you wouldn't mind to sort of then, you know, wrap up some of your thoughts um, because we are, I'm noticing, I think I have about two minutes left, um, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good sort of, um, component to, 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 to end on, right? About now the need to actually generate this political world that Alvin is referring to now. Thanks, Stella. I, I think uh, um, it's okay that I have two minutes because I have one actually phrase that will summarize yeah. everything uh, yeah. that is our experience. And that, that is light bulb. Mm. Many, many women, once they receive this message in a popular language, actually have a light bulb moment. Mm. They begin connecting the, 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 you know, global decisions to their existence right now, actually gives them that light bulb moment. But one of the things I've seen amongst the young women that is extremely exciting me is how urgently they want the problem solved. 
Now, for mm. me, I hope that agency will not last for long because I have been in this tax justice conversation for some time, even ha having been awarded uh, internationally for that for this work. One of the things I know is that a day comes when you wonder whether you want to continue making this noise or just relax and make your money and go and live the soft mm -hmm. life. So, so I, 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 I am really very clear that we must maintain the momentum to keep the energies, energies going and to keep reminding them that it's a cause worth fighting for. And then to also begin demonstrating some of the, the wins that, for example, the Tax Justice Network Africa has had in the conversations we've had. I mean, there was a time when it was impossible to find the whole continent having, you know, the kinds of conversations we're having. There was a time when it was impossible to find, you know, uh, citizen voices in, in, in UNCTAD and, and now we are here. So those pushes may take long, but they deliver. So for me, the, the word is light bulb. The second has got to do with, with um, um, sh should I call it audacity? Mm -hmm. The younger people are more... Audacious. <laughs> audacious. Yes, they, 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 they really are not afraid of things. I remember getting a warning immediately after I got the award that I should not mention the names of uh, multinational corporations that are evading taxes because I may get in trouble. And I figured to myself, wow. Mm -hmm. So you get to the top of this conversation and then you shut up. And I mm -hmm. kept asking myself, maybe I should have just stayed in the community and continued doing what has been down there because nobody was asking me to shut up and they were happy to know which companies were robbing their economies, you know? So for me, audacity is needed even at the top. We have been too nice. We have been operating with kiddie gloves. We have been, you know, uh, uh, trying to look good to the people who we think are urban factors, but the time is, is ripe for us to start having, you know, real conversations and, and call what call it what it is, you know. If you're talking about de decolonizing the global economy, let's not find kind words to say it. If we, we are talking about eating the rich, I mean, we must address the capitalist conversation and, 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 and if we must face it head on, then that's a conversation we must have. And I think amongst the younger women, that's one of the things that we are really getting from them. And I think it's very encouraging. I agree that the South to South forums are a big deal. The women luckily already are organizing around that and already have platforms where the women from the South just meet to convene about their problems. And of course that cre creates um, agency that of course backs them up in this conversation. The more unusual voices we have in this thing in the north and in the south so Pooja I'm going to throw that to you um, and then Alvin I'd be keen to sort of hear your thoughts as well so I think I think I think it's interesting it's it's a layered question right um, so I think there's conversations about what is needed to close the gap between men and women um, both in the north and in the south I think because the dynamics slightly differ there as well so Pooja, I can see you thinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I've understood the question the way the participant might want to articulate it. So that's um, fine. I think I was just, respond yeah, to what yeah. you understand of the question. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I think this is one of the things, and I know Stella also talked about it, where um, when we talk about this kind of macroeconomic framework and where we look locate the gender equality conversation, um, really the entry point has been the recognition of the unpaid domestic and care work, um, which is primarily being carried out by women and the huge subsidy that it provides to the global economy. So when we think about alternative frameworks that is you know, about addressing gender equality, and it's also about kind of addressing the north-south divide, um, really thinking about the care economy and what needs to change there um, is really an important aspect of that. I don't know if that answers the question. I'm sure if there is a lot more complicated dynamics to think about, but at the macro level, that remains, I think, the entry point when we think about gender equality and the contribution to the global economy. But I would imagine Stella yeah. has much more to say. <laughs> but over to Alvin, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Over to, over to Alvin. Are you muted, Alvin? That's a packed question. Before I go to it, let me let me tell Stella that she, I'm not giving away the crown of being the oldest in this space. I understand <laughs> she's been here long enough. Stella, you're still a newbie. So. <laughs> 
I will no, draw my but, statement. <laughs> give it another time. You exactly. You need to withdraw that statement. <laughs> um, no, on on serious note, I think the challenge we face, um, just not just globally, but uh, generally, even at the national level, is that when we talk of actually from the sense of the sense of the of, the, of this um, session, is that inequality is really the foundation of inequality is really about those that have power don't have legitimacy or lack legitimacy and those who have the legitimacy don't have the power mm -hmm. now these can be women who are affected this can be developing countries this can be citizens who don't have effective representation at the global level, this could be developing countries. So in summary, I know this is also a very packed answer. And I think we need actually that the solution lies in, in ensuring that the power, and that's the only way we can address the inequality question, is that those that bear the brand of whatever policy outcomes have the power and are on the table, giving them that legitimacy. And that means again, doing away with institutions that you know, that, that sounds very radical, but digital delegitimizing um, institutions, both at the global and at the, the national level, and giving the institutions that have the legitimacy and representation um, um, the instruments of power to make those decisions. And that means getting women on the, on, 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 on the driver's seat on issues that affect the most. That means giving citizens, uh, when you talk of the social contract uh, conversation, Chana, we had this morning about the role that citizens have in, 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 in setting or in determining. Uh, tax policy at the national level, the same mirrors also in the global level, how do you get developing countries on the table on decisions that are being affected with uh, digital taxation, we see the kind of disruption it is having. Um, and not having these countries or the affected people as partakers of these issues, and that's really what happens, affects all constituencies that we are largely partakers of those decisions. These are made somewhere and then you have been told now um, you can you can run with this. This could be developing countries. This could be women in 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 uh, in, uh, in 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 some context or or any other excluded excluded group. So it's really changing that on its head, ensuring that uh, uh, we are creating legit legitimate uh, spaces for, for decision making, particularly those that are affected are also in the room and have the power um, uh, to 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 contribute to the decisions that that is affecting them. Awesome. Can I just say I second Alan yeah, yeah. on everything. I wish he had spoken first, so I could have just said I second. <laughs> I know, so you can and jump I feel like I understand the question point. now. Now listening to his answer, so I can't take that answer. You, you, that I second yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you do you want to throw, throw something in there? But there, no, you're good. Awesome. No, no, no. That's Della, do you want to put well something said, in there yeah. as we wrap up? Or, my my my, yeah. my thoughts are quite in, in line with with Alvin's thoughts on power. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is basically transfer of power, whether yeah. voluntary or, in, or involuntary. Uh, mm -hmm. The kind of conversations we're having in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the women's sector and even with the youth right now is not to wait for that power to be given to them. So that's, mm -hmm. that, that's the transfer of power. When yeah. I say involuntary, sometimes it's not just about going to the streets to protest, but also laws, because laws compel people to behave a certain way. We have seen increases in numbers of rep uh, women representation in, in, in parliaments because of laws that have been passed in countries. And so if we manage to push certain laws in certain jurisdictions, we are going to actually be able to begin seeing a difference in the gap between men and women. But then the most important thing, and, and probably this may not have come, up, come out as strongly from, from Alvin and, and, and Puja is uh, um, the fact that this is a, is, a, is, a, is a personal job. It's a very personal job, attitude change beginning to acknowledge that women are never going to leave um, uh, this globe. They're here to stay. And we, when we depart, we all depart together. And of course, accepting that it has been demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that women are making tremendous contributions to trade, to governance, to every aspect of life. And, and some of that work has gone unthanked for a very long time. And so just that realization and getting people to begin adjusting their thinking and their attitude of course, for me, it's going to be a, a better, rather, it's going to have a, a, a domino effect compared to trying to compel people to get things right. Mm, awesome, thanks. And I, I think that's an excellent note to, to wrap up on because I know we've run a little bit over time. Um, but thank you so much to, to all of you for, for, for taking the time, I think, to, to participate in this conversation. 
I, I feel like we literally just scratched the surface, you know, in terms of a conversation that really has so much nuance to it, um, as was obviously evidenced by this very last um, question that was just posed. Um, but I, I think I think you know one of the one of the major takeaways, right, is that this the the, the need to decolonize the economy still remains. Uh, pressing still remains urgent, right? Um, secondly, this is much more a, a political uh, conversation than it is than it is a, a technical conversation. Um, thirdly, power is not easily relinquished, right? And so we may need to, we, we have to at times engage, you know, in in activities where we need to take that power back. And I think it it responds to you know Alvin's point around you know who has the legitimacy it, the people who have the legitimacy to be contributing to these conversations are the ones who should be contributing and we may need to engage you know in um activities whereby we take that legitimacy back the authority to contribute to these conversations in ways that may be uncomfortable at times um to those that currently are in those positions of power so thank you again so much puja alvin and stella for for making the time to be a part of this conversation to be a part of this side event um, thank you so much to all of you who took the time to, to watch and listen in to this conversation. Um, could I encourage you um, to please um, go to the website of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice. Um, as Alvin had mentioned, we are currently running a campaign to try and topple um, you know, some of these powers that exist currently in the global taxation system that are perpetuating the inequality that we're seeing. Um, in terms of you know the the financial architecture, so please go to the Gatti Alliance. You'll see the statement, and we are requesting for as many different civil society organisations um, to sign on to that statement. So enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you've joined us from, and we look forward to continuing these conversations um, in in different spaces. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Great, thank you Richard. Um, well, welcome everyone to the breakout session side event at the UNCTAD Civil Society Forum on um, Sustainable Solutions to Debt Crisis, the role of UNCTAD. Uh, well, while welcome people are still joining, it's, it's a good. People tend to start a few minutes late. Let me use the time to give a bit of a larger opening statement before we then go to inter interactive panel discussions and then I hope a very lively discussion also with the audience, obviously with the other participants. Um, well, first of all, let me welcome you on behalf of the four organizers of our event. Um, this is Beyond Global Policy Forum. This is also Jubilee, the Jubilee USA Network, the European Network on Debt and Development, and Debt Justice Norway. My name is Bodo Elmers. I'm in charge of the Financing for Sustainable Development Program at Global Policy Forum Europe. Um, I personally uh, have quite a lot of experience also in working with the UNCTAD, never in the UNCTAD, but with the UNCTAD. I've been part of an UNCTAD expert group on debt workout mechanisms um, um, a while ago. I've also been, been, yeah, been participating in UNCTAD debt management conferences. So the UNCTAD's debt work was always a very personal affair for me as well. So I'm very happy to, to be co-organizing the side event today. Well, I think, um, I mean, UNCTAD 15 obviously takes place in a quite exceptional situation in a situation where debt issues, uh, debt problems worldwide have reached all time highs. Uh, this is even the situation I think is even worse than when we met four years ago, five years ago in Nairobi, where I also participated basically where the debt problems had already grown up. Uh, but I mean, due to the COVID crisis, we have a massive new debt shock. We had even before the crisis, we had the situation that um, almost half of developing countries were, in, were rated as in debt distress or high risk of debt distress. And due to COVID-19, due to the COVID shock, the economic shock, of course, things got even worse. And well, I mean, absolute debt levels is one thing, but um, as we all know, the worst thing or the most problematic thing is, of course, that countries have to devote more and more resources to paying off debt. Um, Daniel, Daniel Munevaro from UDAT, who is also joining us today, um, he did a lot of research on it. So the, the figures are really drastic that more and more budget, more and more revenue goes into financing debt service instead of financing, financing education, financing health, financing critical infrastructure. So debt problems indeed became became high, solving debt problems became highly critical to basically to to development as a whole to to also to rescuing people's life livelihoods. Um, we should have met in Barbados today. Um, it's of course a pity that we could not do that. That we have to meet online, not just because Barbados is a is a very beautiful place, and I 
I'd like to thank our, our co-hosts from CBDC and the government of Barbados very much for, for, well, for hosting us, even if it's just online today. Um, Barbados had also for a second reason been a good place to have this discussion because um, especially small island development states are among the most um, indebted countries in the world. So um, I think, I mean, you had the, if you participated yesterday, you had the former finance minister of Barbados speak. Um, he spoke very drastically about the situation in six countries. Just at the closing session today, we had a comrade from Barbados say, and talking about the unfair, high and crippling debt situation in which Barbados is in. So the situation mm -hmm. in SITS has, has been as particularly problematic, but not just in not just in SITS, basically all over all over developing countries, of course. And actually not just there, but also in the global north, um, debt levels have um, have reached extremely high levels. Well, today, I mean, we had a quite general discussion about that issue, or not a general, but I mean, a, a good policy discussion in the previous days today, uh, in the previous days already on debt issues. Today, we want to focus more on the on the UNCTAD mandate as such, or the role that UNCTAD is, we want UNCTAD to play in the coming four years following the UNCTAD 15 conference and on the ongoing negotiations. Uh, before we start, and that's the last thing I'm going to say, I want to give a quick overview um, of what UNCTAD has done in the past but so that we can in the panel discussions talk about the future uh, i hope i'm going to do this well because i know with you and i have somebody on my panel who's who has been very much involved in this sort of work but let me um let me outline a few roles that UNCTAD has has been playing in the past so UNCTAD is on the one hand taking a convening role um UNCTAD is organizing big debt management conferences every two years and that has also played a role in the, uh, the UNCTAD Financing for Development Group, which um, expert group, which has been convened after the UNCTAD 14 conference in Nairobi. That's one role, the convening role. UNCTAD also has a, has a big technical assistance program. This is the so-called DEMPFAS program, a second role. But then um, UNCTAD has also a standard setting role. So UNCTAD has, for instance, two expert group processes developed um, Principles for responsible lending and borrowing. UNCTAD has developed a concept for um, a, a roadmap and guide for so and that workout. So UNCTAD has played in the standard setting process extremely important roles. UNCTAD is doing a lot of research in general. You might have seen the recent trade and development report. Lots of these research is mainstream throughout the UNCTAD publications. And um, last but not least, I would say UNCTAD is consulting the UN development system as a whole in, in debt issues affairs. For instance, the UN General Assembly but also basically, I mean, other institutions of the UN development system. So this, this is where we're coming from. And basically, if, um, in, the, in, the, in the coming hour we have left, we want to discuss where we want to go to, basically, with UNCTAD in the coming years. And um, that's, of course, we, that takes place in the context of the UNCTAD 15, um, 15 um, conference, the outcome document negotiation, which are taking place now. And, well, I have, a, I have an excellent panel of three distinguished speakers to join me today, basically. And now that I think that our, our membership is, uh, our participants have joined the call, let me introduce you. This is um, first at Yufin Lee. Yufin is representing the South Center today, but um, in previous stages, uh, the South Center is, of course, a think tank or an organization of developing countries I might have um, based in Geneva, which follows UNCTAD processes closely. But Yufin has also been, a, a, she's a retired head of the debt and development finance branch from, of the UNCTAD, so she knows the UNCTAD very much from the inside, and she's also um, a former UN independent expert on debt and human rights. So welcome, Yufin, nice to have you. Then, uh, uh, think, second, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, okay. Um, then we have Atia Varis, Professor Atia Varis. She's a professor at the University of Nairobi in her day job for understand, fiscal law and policy. But uh, Atia has also recently um, assumed the post of UN independent expert in front of the human rights. Congratulations once again. And um, yeah, Atia, this is basically, uh, Atia is going to join us in this capacity today. And yeah, last but not least, we have Anahi Wiedenbrück, who is um, a representative of, the, of Argentina. She works for the Ministry of Economy in Argentina. But beyond that, um, she's also she has also well, she has also a background in academics, of course. She has written, written many publications also on debt and human rights issues. She's a PhD from the London School of Economics. And for me personally, very important, I need to say that Anaï, she also has been an intern at the Global Policy Forum office in New York, my organization's office, many, many years ago in very early stages of her career. So welcome everyone. Um yeah, um 
perhaps to start and perhaps we start with you Finn. you Finn, you just released and um, there was the last thing you did as independent expert basically you you released a new report on debt architecture issues um on on on, on necessary debt architecture reforms can you can you outline what a few of your of the key asks of the report are what, what what do you think needs to be done now in the coming years okay uh thank you bodo for the introduction and good afternoon everyone uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will come to the report very soon. Let me just say a few words about the civil society forum as a whole. Uh, we know that uh, uh, each UNCTAD ministerial conference would be uh, preceded uh, by the civil society forum, uh, which has never failed to highlight the major contentious uh, negotiation issues of the outcome document of the UNCTAD conferences uh, and also offer strong support for bolstering the role of UNCTAD. Uh, strangely enough, we know that except for the uh, heydays of UNCTAD, uh, most of the UNCTAD conferences would be a tug of war between weakening and strengthening of UNCTAD. Almost each time the civil society would make a major impact on the outcome document, uh, showing the important role of the civil society in the international affairs. Uh, despite the frequent debt crisis in developing countries and the fact that UNCTAD is the focal point uh, on the debt issues within the UN system as mandated by the GA resolutions, that issue has always been, uh, if not the uh, major conten contentious issues uh, during the negotiations of many UNCTAD conferences. Therefore, I would like to thank wholeheartedly uh, the four organizers uh, of this side event, Global Policy Forum, Eurodad, Jubilee USA, and uh, uh, Debt Norway for organizing this side event and uh, I would uh, uh, like to hope that the main takeaways uh, for uh, this uh, side event uh, would be reflected in some way in the civil society declaration. Of course, I don't know the procedure, it's just my own wish. Uh, now, Abodo, let me turn to the report you are referring to. Uh, I was the uh, independent expert till 1st of August this year, and I'm pleased that Professor Atiya Waris has been appointed as my successor. Uh, I'm sure with uh, her rich experience and excellent uh, qualifications, uh, she will no doubt at all do an excellent job. Uh, in view of the submission time this year for the GA, a report on debt and human rights. Uh, she was not able to participate uh, because uh, uh, she had not taken up the position yet. So I have uh, prepared the report on debt and human rights with the support of the staff from the High uh, Commissioner's Office. Uh, the report is entitled uh, International Debt Architecture Reform and Human Rights. Uh, we, we know that the international debt architecture has been outdated and with gaps and also weak links. Thus, it uh, does not have sufficient capacity and mechanism to respond to debt crises uh, in an effective and timely manner, especially during a global crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. And most importantly, it is not able to serve to prevent future crises, especially now, the debt burden of developing countries, as mentioned by Bordeaux just now, has exploded further because of the pandemic and reached an unprecedented level. More countries are in debt distress or high risk of debt distress. Meanwhile, uh, with the tapering, uh, borrowing costs will be increasing uh, as we foresee. Uh, this is happening at a time when the peak of debt servicing for quite a number of countries is coming in the next year or the next two to three years. So the constrained fiscal space, contraction of GDP, increasing expenditure, 
limited uh, liquidity provision and high cost of borrowing all happening at the same time. So it's a kind of a combination for the coming of a new debt crisis. Uh, the, because of this, uh, in the uh, report, uh, I've made some recommendations for reform of the international architecture. Because of time, I just list a few of the recommendations. First uh, is uh, providing sufficient liquidity to countries hard hit by the pandemic, including middle-income countries. Uh, for the new allocation of 650 billion US dollars of SDRs, it is welcome, but not sufficient. And it is very necessary to formulate a workable mechanism to allow donated and used SDRs to be re-channeled, recycled to countries in urgent need of, uh, of unconditional liquidity. Furthermore, the mechanism uh, should not be housed and hosted entirely by the IMF. Uh, they should continue to reform the quota system. The re reallocation of special drawing rights must not be counted as ODA, and there should be adequate increase in the funding of concessional facilities, uh, increases in ODA and uh, uh, sustained positive net resource transfer are all very much necessary. Secondly, reform the credit rating agencies. There was a separate report on this. I will not go to details of this because we know the current initiatives ha have been hampered by the credit rating agencies. So it's a problem. And the third is further reform of debt sustainability assessment system. And also uh, efforts should be made to formulate a multilateral debt workout mechanism. Uh, this should be agreed upon, designed and implemented uh, with the United Nations playing an important role. So uh, I will not give you the whole list. I just give you some of the points mentioned in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Yufin. And, Do you want uh, me to go to the second part? Yeah. I'm uh, quickly. Let me. I mean, first of all, thanks for the suggestion that indeed that many of the elements from this session should be taken over in the civil society declaration. I'm not part of the drafting group, but I hope that somebody from the drafting group is listening and taking notes because I understand that in the coming session, in the last session of the civil society forum, we will discuss or agree on the text. So this is indeed. I mean, I hope that we that indeed the session is reflected there. I assume because of the relevance for Barbados as such also that, that it's taken, it's, it's being made, made clear that um, that, that um, yeah, that, that the debt problems are gonna um, are considered there in to, well, as much as they should do. Um, but you can, a question for you because you, um, I mean, you, you are of course an UNCTAD insider. So um, when we look at your reform agenda, which parts of this ref agenda would you basically allocate to the UNCTAD? What, where, how would you could say, how, how could the UNCTAD contribute or what, what precisely could UNCTAD do in the, in the coming four years to, to make sure that we see progress in debt architectural reforms? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think to push forward the agenda to reform the international debt architecture, uh, UNCTAD has a unique and very important role to play. Uh, firstly, together with the IMF World Bank, uh, UNDESA, UNCTAD is a major institutional stakeholder on debt and financial issues. So it's important to point out the, the relationship between the institutions is not that of competition or duplication, as some people and some countries think. Instead, these institutions are common stakeholders working together to reinforce each other. Uh, IMF, World Bank, UNCTAD, and UNDESA sit together in almost all the highest decision-making bodies on financial issues, including reform of international financial and debt system and architecture. Uh, we know that at each IMF, World Bank annual meeting, there would be uh, the meeting of International Monetary and Financial Committee, which major uh, finance ministers and central bank governors would attend, 
to discuss important uh, systemic issues. It is chaired always by the IMF managing director. UNTAD and UNDESA are observers and can speak and can uh, submit uh, written statements uh, the, at each session. Uh, uh, together with the famous ministers and governors at these meetings. So UN major meetings also invite IMF and, and the World Bank to participate. However, it is really baffling that that issue has been a contentious one for almost each dead conference as uh, on that conference, as I mentioned just now, uh, because uh, some countries and some delegates consider uh, finance and debt issues as territory reserved for the IMF and the World Bank. But many UNGA resolutions and uh, in, uh, outcome documents of international conferences have clearly specified IMF, World Bank, UNTAD, and UNDESA as major institutional stakeholders in debt and finance issues and request them to work together. So it is important to highlight uh, that UNCAD is mandated to analyze debt issues and put forward recommendations from the perspective of developing countries. So they should, first of all, be allowed to play this role. Uh, so UNCAD is not at all uh, competing with the UN DESA either, because there was also the discussion that UNCAD is taking over DESA's role. It's not. Uh, for instance, next Monday, on the 27th, the USG of DESA is going to organize a principles meeting on interagency task force uh, on FFD. UNCAD has been invited, so is the South Center, so that I know. Uh, so from my time in UNCAD, I know that UNCAD has provided regular inputs for the EATF uh, reports on systemic issues of international financial system. Uh, the same reason why UNCTAD intergovernmental expert meeting on FFD uh, has always been reported to uh, ECOSOC. It is uh, uh, actually requested by the ECOSOC uh, resolutions and GA resolutions. Uh, we know that UNCTAD is also an observer of G24, a group uh, which discusses monetary and financial issues of developing countries. UNCTAD is the lead agency for preparing GA report for the second committee uh, each year. So UNCTAD has a voice and is a major stakeholder on the financial and debt issues at the highest levels of the international financial and debt architecture. Therefore, uh, I think UNCTAD can certainly play an important role in pushing forward the reform agenda uh, and reform actions I mentioned just now uh, relating to the international uh, debt ar architecture. Uh, secondly, we know that historically UNCTAD has the mandate and, and also ex the expertise in dealing with debt issues. Uh, UNCTAD has uh, worked on debt and financial issues from its establishment, from UNCTAD 1 conference, actually. Uh, and UNCTAD as the focal point within the UN system on debt issues has a critical role to play in su supporting global efforts towards a durable solution to the problem of the debt, uh, pro debt problems of developing countries. We know, uh, and you also mentioned, uh, Bodo, uh, that UNCTAD was among the first international institutions calling for uh, orderly debt workout procedures. Actually, that was in 1971. Uh, UNCTAD Secretariat has been providing uh, developing countries uh, with support for Paris Club debt rescheduling. Uh, and uh, uh, UNCTAD actually was present at the Paris Club meetings together with the IMF and the World Bank. So that shows why UNCTAD should uh, play a role on the debt issues and financial issues. Uh, uh, Bodo, you mentioned just now about uh, the UNCTAD principles on responsible song lending and borrowing, uh, which was uh, acknowledged uh, by uh, several GA res resolutions, FFD outcome and other resolutions. And uh, 
uh, for the GA uh, resolution on sovereign debt restructuring principles you, you mentioned just now, it was based on the research outcome of an untapped project. Actually, I headed that, which had been prepared by world renowned experts for two years, and uh, many NGOs, including uh, Border, was involved. And another reason is, as a matter of fact, the UNCAD and IMF need each other. The IMF is like a shareholding company with major developed countries controlling most of the voting power. In the IMF, interests of main shareholders are protected. This determines that it is difficult for IMF staff to push for innovative and ahead of the curve policy recommendations especially those require short-term sacrifices for long-term benefits. If we recall the major initiatives that IMF have implemented, like HIPPICS, MDRI, and lending into arrears, all of them have been pushed from outside, not from inside. Uh, UNCAD has advocated all of these initiatives. So this time during the pand pandemic, we know UNCAD was among the first to call for the new issuance of SD, uh, SDRs. So actually, by making such a kind of policy recommendations, UNCTAD has been helping the IMF to persuade its major stakeholders to take needed actions. So in concluding, I hope the mandate over UNCTAD's work on debt and finance and systemic issues uh, would be preserved and strengthened through UNCTAD 15 and not weakened at a time when many developing countries are facing uh, debt sustainability risks, as you mentioned just now, and as uh, Euro data very clearly has pointed out. So it is essential that UNCTAD can undertake independent research and propose policy recommendations on systemic reform issues. We need UNCTAD to take care of the interests of developing countries, especially at the, the current time when there are lots of risks and developing countries are facing really major uh, debt sustainability issues. Thank you, Bodo. I hope I answer your question. You did indeed, yeah, very, very comprehensively. And you referred a lot to the consultancy role that that UNCTAD is indeed playing to, towards other in in international processes and in in um, in well, in cooperation with other international organizations. I I also see this a lot, basically, that UNCTAD is bringing in an important perspective and often um, a, a perspective that very much takes the takes the interests of developing countries into account, of course, in these processes. So I think that's a key function. And of course, also the pioneer role. I mean, I think UNCTAD is often faster and more flexible when it comes to having creative ideas than, than other organizations are. And I think this is indeed this is indeed cool, a cool, good role. And then when we talk about the, some of the topics you mentioned, I think also in debt sustainability analysis, I also see a research role for, for, for UNCTAD in the coming years, basically, because it has been an issue that UNCTAD has been dealing before already in the past to look at new ways um, for debt sustainability analysis. And, this has also been a key concern for NGOs. We, for instance, we advocated for, for decades that we would need, need more human rights-based approach to, to looking at that sustainability that you cannot basically, that you cannot expect that a country which has a difficult fiscal situation spends scarce resources on, on, on that service while basically it has, well, as, as it once has been said, it has to, to starve the population to death basically while doing so. Well, and let's bring in the, the, uh, our other panelists into the debate. I think that's a good good moment to ask Atia to come in, Atia Varis. And um, well, first of all, great again to have you. Um, it, it has always been very important for us as CSO community to work with the UN Independent Expert on Debt and Human Rights. And I think the the um, the cooperation has always been very 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 very, very tight and very very fruitful for both parties. So um, I personally have, have also, I think I. I even worked with Sifas Lumina already and with Juan Pablo also and with Yufen, and then I look very much forward to working with you in the, in the coming years. Um, perhaps to start with, what, what, what are your plans? I mean, you just assumed the mandate. What, what are your plans for the, for the what, what's on, your, on the top of your agenda? Well, thank you very much, Bodo. I'm delighted to be here. Um, but, but I want to jump off something that uh, Yufen said as well. And, and first, I'd like to say I'm... I'm so honored to be on the same panel as her and humbled that I get to um, 
stand in after her and I, I look forward to continuing to work with her going forward. Um, but uh, there's something else in, in the report that you um, prepared, which is she, she also talks about the fact that we are trading off payment on debt instead of focusing on human rights and it's a, a line in her report that i will i will present in in uh, later in next month and it resonated with me and and i was very appreciative of it but uh, going forward i'm my call for contributions is out um and basically Basically, my going to be looking at a, a whole set of priority areas, of course, in addition to debt, um, issues around fiscal legitimacy and the fiscal social contract, but also areas around the transparency of financial and tax information and its linkages to digital systems. Um, another area that I will be looking at will be the environment, illicit financial flows and debt, uh, as well as in addition to COVID, humanitarian conflict and other types of crises and uh, natural emergencies and their financial obligations and the linkages to them. So my call for contribution is, is out on the website. I'd like to encourage people to please um, contribute. I'm looking forward to hearing positions. And of course, um, all the, the members in the, the debt coalitions have been strong supporters of my mandate and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, all of them. But I would like to reiterate that this is a space of constant multiple and converging crises and then that's what i'm seeing i'm seeing crises in every single space and the result is a growing inequality um, including my own uh, continent but also there are essential links that we need to make between um, financing and fiscal capacities and its linkages to human rights and i think for me uh, again resonating off what you fen has talked about is UNCTAD is an incredibly important um, space to have those conversations and linkages and the area of not only debt, but from my perspective, also illicit financial flows. I mean, UNCTAD has provided a framework um, for some of the most comprehensive overviews uh, for discussions and advances at the global arena. And some of their reports uh, include the ones that came out in 2017 and 2015 on responsible sovereign lending and borrowing amongst others. Um, but I'd like to stop there and, and hear what others have to say and I'll come back in again. Thank you, Bodu. Well, thank you. And um, well, I think it's an important link you're making with, with, I mean, linking that to illicit financial flows and also environment issues. I actually, I just, um, we just circulated a, a new, a new, um, new petition on climate debt issues and an NGO declaration because, of course, the link between environment issues and debt issues is, is a key one, of course, and not, and especially also for, for, for the country that hosts us virtually today for Barbados, which is a country like many small island development states, which fell into a debt crisis because it has, has been hit by natural disasters, like they're quite frequent. And so I think it's a great way to explore this further. But yeah, um, then let's move on to our third panelist, Anayi. Um, Anayi, you're you're actually quite, a, let's say, a funny animal for our CSO forum today because there have been very few government pa um, representatives participating. When I looked at the agenda, I wasn't sh I wasn't aware of this when 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 we designed the the CSO forum that most of the panels were basically indeed CSOs only and there were not so much multi stakeholders. So um, many thanks for having the courage to join us today in the, in the CSO group. But of course, I mean, you're you're sort of due to your background, you're sort of one of us. So it's, it's very nice to, ha to have you. Um, but yeah, of, of course, officially you're, you're representing the government of Argentina. So and Argentina is 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 very actively, as I understand, you are also the. I mean, compared to, and opposite to all of us, you have really insights of what's going on at the negotiations at the moment. Um, so could you explain us a little bit um, what what Argentina what 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 Argentina wants to get out of the Young Dutch Crimson Conference? What what your priorities are? What you're negotiating at the moment? Absolutely. Well, first of all, let me also uh, thank you both for the invitation. It is actually my honor to be here in this kind of panel with these incredibly distinguished speakers. Uh, so the thanks are kind of go from my side to yours mostly. So thank you really much, very much for having me. I think that to answer your question very shortly, and I think this is something that is also echoing some of the things that have already been said in this panel, is that Argentina's main aim for the conference is to get a very clear mandate for UNCTAD to be able to carry out technically sound and actionable work to reform the international debt architecture over the next four years. Of course, uh, and this is going to be your follow-up question, I assume, this only begs the question, because um, 
you need to say a little bit more, and this is what I want to do now in a couple of minutes, with regards to what it is that we want to see changed. So in our opinion, uh, the international debt architecture should be able to ensure efficient, predictable, and equitable debt restructurings. This means that an adequate international debt architecture should facilitate um, restructurings that ensure debt and macroeconomic sustainability in the debtor country. Conversely, an architecture which incentivizes too little restructurings is inefficient. Recessions become more persistent, including due to the underutilization of resources, and decrease what is available for creditors if a default occurs. In essence, the size, the size of the pie simply gets smaller. An efficient restructuring also needs to be timely. An architecture facilitates timely restructuring when it does not make them too costly. If too costly, political leaders might need to gamble for resurrection, delaying the recognition of that unsustainability. In addition, timely restructurings are enabled by an architecture which avoids the unnecessary protraction of the negotiation process. So, so turning now to kind of my second criteria, we think that international and uh, international debt architecture also needs to ensure predictable restructurings. This is not easy because uh, welcomed innovations in debt markets and or the emergence of new types of creditors and borrowers, which are very welcomed, may raise new unexpected challenges in restructurings. Contracts are also inherently incomplete and residual uncertainty regarding contractual interpretation is always likely to remain. In the absence of a framework for solving debt restructuring, as the one uh, just mentioned by uh, UFN, which has an, an independent oversight commission that settles interpretation disputes, the outcome of the restructuring process thus continues to be dependent on the contextual circumstances, as well as on the good faith, knowledge, skill, and power of the negotiating parties. And third, and I think this is the most crucial point which I would like to stress the most, an adequate architecture should ensure a level playing field against the backdrop of which debt restructurings can be conducted. If there are too big asymmetries between creditors and debtors of any kind of information, resources, or power, neither the process nor the outcome of the restructuring will be equitable between debtors and creditors. So if we take this to be the yardstick, if we take pr efficient, predictable, and equitable debt restructuring as the yardstick, it is clear that the current architecture does not endure anything close to it. The last generation of collective action clauses, which to be sure are contracts and are not an architecture in any meaningful sense of the word, are useful in reducing the possibility of fault out creditors. Yet they do not avoid restructurings that are too little and too late, continue to leave room for legal uncertainty and ambiguity, and most importantly, are unable to ensure a level playing field for negotiation. We also think that the G20 initiatives, although important, both the DSSI and the Common Framework, are narrow in scope and remain insufficient to achieve effective, predictable, and fair solutions to sovereign debt crisis. The DSSI, which only applies to public bilateral official debt of either countries, is a temporal measure, which is set to expire at the end of 2021 and thus does not do anything to solve long-term problems of the international debt architecture. The common framework, on the other hand, which is equally narrow in scope, is facing important implementation problems, which are challenging its viability, not least the absence of participation of private sector creditors. This leaves emerging markets and developing countries with debt burns, which may be unsustainable and with no mechanism to restructure in an efficient, equitable and predictable manner. So very concretely, Bodo, to get back to your question, what we want is a clear mandate for UNCTAD to be able to produce technically sound and actionable work to reform the international de debt architecture in such a way as to ensure this form of restructurings. And we're concretely working on two paragraphs, uh, one which is in the financing for development section, and the other one which is in kind of the last section um, on UNCTAD mandate, um, in order to kind of try to make that a reality. We are, uh, we made important progress, and um, especially on the first kind of paragraph in the first financing for development section. Um, and we're still kind of pushing very hard to get uh, the same outcome for, for kind of the section of paragraph of the last paragraph, par paragraph 112, where we want to have this clear mandate. And before concluding and kind of uh, 
passing on the floor uh, to others or kind of for follow up questions. I just wanted to kind of echo what some of the things that were also said with regards to the importance of UNCTAD and why we think that UNCTAD should do so. So we think that UNCTAD should do so first because it has the mandate to do so. We've all already heard kind of a lot uh, with regards to this specifically, but I think that the General Assembly resolution of 1995 clearly includes debt related work under the scope of UNCTAD's mandate, and that's something that we need to underline and uh, remember. Um, second, we think that UNCTAD has the technical expertise to do so. Again, here we heard a lot already on all the different things that UNCTAD has been doing, but this is something that also from Argentina's perspective is absolutely cr crucial as to why we think that UNCTAD is the institution that should carry this work forward. And finally, we think that um, UNCTAD has a very diverse membership and a history of solidly analyzing problems of emerging and developing new economies. And thus, we think that it is excellently, excellently placed to take this work forward. I'll stop here for, for the moment. Yeah, I managed to unmute. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I see a clear preference for improving debt restructuring work and debt restructuring framework, which I, I agree is, is a key key deficit. And I would also agree that I mean, what happened, what we've seen since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, the DSSI and the common framework are, are largely insufficient, basically, to, to, to solve the fundamental problems we had actually already before, before the, the crisis began. Um, before, I, uh, one more question to the panelists, but before I say that, um, just to everyone else following us today, you can ask questions through Slido. Slido, there's a, there's a, there's a button to the right of your screen when you're using the UNCTAD 15 platform. Um, the, the, it seems that we have a plan B. Uh, the idea was that the Slido question is going to be forwarded to the chat here. This does not happen. I'm getting them, them through WhatsApp on my phone. So when it's beeping in the background, it's basically um, that I will probably have to read them out later. But yeah, if you want to ask questions, please please uh, use the Slido function and I will get them on my phone and I will try to summarize them then for the panelists. Um, Perhaps one last question to, to you, Anahi, but perhaps to all of you, because um, I mean, you, of course, in, the UNCTAD is in Geneva, and um, you in Buenos Aires, which is far away, Atia, you in Nairobi. Um, how, I mean, how, how can, I mean, what, what, how can the UNCTAD work? I mean, what, what can the UNCTAD do for a country like yours, basically? Or how can we strengthen the link between the, the excellent work that the UNCTAD is doing in Geneva, basically, to the country level, to the, to the, well, basically to, to, I mean, to, I don't know, through the United Nations Development System, or how can we make the UNCTAD's work more, more impact more on, or more useful for you in, in the countries where, where you are? Perfect. I, I can go first uh, in kind of taking a first step on answering this question, and then please uh, feel free, Atiyah and UFN to, to jump in as well. Um, as you know, Argentina is a country that um, has had experiences in the past uh, with uh, several restructurings in its history. And um, we've kind of finalized um, the most recent restructuring in 2020 um, and are now with pr private sector treasures under both foreign and domestic uh, law. Uh, and we're now in the process of kind of restructuring with, with the fund with the IMF. And um, I think I, I kind of like to tell you a little bit about our main kind of lessons or experiences with that restructuring, because I think that uh, it grounds very nicely Bodo, what we think that UCTAD can do for the, for the Argentinas of this world, but also for countries with slightly different um, kind of circumstances. So I think that for us, um, the we're, we're kind of basically very satisfied with the um, restructuring that we concluded in 2020. Um, I would also say that we are um, proud of it. Uh, we grounded it in uh, our own debt sustainability analysis, whose main conclusions were then also echoed by a second debt sustainability analysis by the IMF. And um, this agreement kind of that we found really restored debt sustainability and gave Argentina a very important breathing space. And um, so we would say that it was uh, efficient for structuring. At the same time, and, and this is the point that I also wanted to stress before, the negotiations clearly demonstrated how short the international debt architecture falls in ensuing equitable debt restructurings. So while in the case of Argentina specifically, we had the ability to put together a team that had the necessary skills and knowledge to counteract the intense pressure that private creditors put on Argentina, both inside and outside of the negotiation room. 
We think that not all countries have the Argentine government's experience um, to do so and to ensure a true level playing field in the negotiations. So, so this is where we think that UNCTAD's role is absolutely critical. Um, UNCTAD, we think, needs to continue providing technical cooperation and advisory services uh, to developing countries, and as well as to work on alternatives that tackle most of the credit debtor imbalances and asymmetries in the international financial architecture. And it could also help, uh, hopefully, <laughs> reach high level political consensus to promote these reforms that we're looking for. Great, I'm not, Atiyah or you can perhaps, you also want, want to comment on this question. Isn't it? May I? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, well, I keep uh, hooking back onto the, the UN Secretary General's most recent report on our, our common agenda, which was released on the 10th of September. And I think that that actually provides a really great um, first step for UNCTAD as well as other UN bodies to start working better together. I think he's uh, the, the Secretary General is pulling uh, for more multilateral work uh, global, relating to a series of these common and very global challenges, which I think are, are fantastic. And of those 12 uh, commitments, uh, one of them, the, the ninth one is on sustainable financing and it, the need to, in, uh, um, specifically inclusive of the need to resolve weaknesses in the debt architecture, the language it uses, and ensuring a fairer and more resilient um, trading system. But it also talks about including a reinvigorated WTO. So I think making those sort of parallel linkages and then bringing those down into nation states will become very important. And for countries like mine, these UNCTAD reports that have been coming out are extremely important. And I think getting them to be mainstreamed in domestic uh, discussions at state level, but even at um, regional and continental level, getting them embedded in those spaces and discussed, I think will be extremely useful going forward. I, I cannot uh, em emphasize enough how important UNCTAD is for developing countries, really. Thank you, Bodo. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps even also for you, because I'm. Um, I mean, I hear from um, a provocative criticism from the U.S. often that UNCTAD needs to get more effective. Basically, and my my own observation is definitely not that UNCTAD is not effective, but that there is not. It's not always easy to bring the people to the UNCTAD in Geneva and to bring UNCTAD's work to the country level. So, um, if uh, if you have also from from your insider perspective, if you have any ideas how this can be um, how this this can be strengthened, the link the link between Geneva and the country level is it. It would would it could it work through a better cooperation with your development system or what what type of I, what what would you say about that? Well, I would say actually, um, I, I just recall my days in UNCTAD. I, I thought we had quite close uh, working relationship with countries. Uh, just talk about Argentina. I personally visited Argentina several times. Uh, when I was heading the, uh, the branch on uh, development finance. Uh, and actually, uh, the, the official from your president's office uh, came to my office to discuss some of the issues. Of course, I, we wouldn't mention a word about that. Uh, and uh, during the, the lawsuit uh, with the voucher funds, we also tried to help. Uh, but at one point, uh, there was the request for us to appear on the court, to, but the UN system wouldn't allow us, but we, we did try to help from different angles. So this shows uh, you that uh, the UNCTAD Secretariat has been providing uh, advisory services to countries in different forms. But there are some of the work which we cannot uh, really uh, announce and make it public. And just now, Bodo, you mentioned about the DEMPAS program. DEMPAS program actually is helping uh, countries in managing their debt uh, through providing of uh, the software analysis of the debt management of the country. Uh, once again, it is at a kind of uh, uh, level that you cannot release a loss of the actual work. Uh, the, the country, the government, and the secretariat will sign a kind of uh, a confidential, um, how would you say that, agreement that you cannot use the data, you cannot use this, you are just helping. Uh, 
So at the country level, uh, Ontario has been helping the developing countries and mostly at request. Uh, yeah, but we, we wouldn't just uh, you know go uh, forward and say uh, this thing we think you should do like this. We we might push uh, out uh, analytical pieces relating to some work, but we don't openly criticizing uh, criticizing a country on this or that. You know over borrowing or whatever, but we alert countries, for instance, uh, at one point, uh, some countries think it is very safe to borrow domestic debt. And then immediately it spread very quickly. So it was us who did analysis to say, actually domestic debt is not that domestic and you will still run uh, the kind of uh, mismatches of currency and uh, uh, interest rate and other things uh, through what channel. So we have to provide this kind of uh, analysis. And for some countries, they would over borrow. For instance, uh, I'm just recording my days. I, I went to attend uh, the bank and fund uh, annual meeting and uh, we were in some of the, I was in some of the African ministers uh, meetings, they invited me to speak. But at that time, at that particular time, when I went to speak at that meeting, I realized some African countries, they really over borrowed because they didn't know when they floated their, their, their bonds, they didn't know what kind of problems they were facing. So I said, please be cautious. And some of the ministers came to me and said, yeah, but we didn't like you to tell us to be cautious. Why don't you? Yeah. And then I have uh, other agencies, uh, underwriters who say you must go ahead and borrow more. So that was a fight between UNCTAD cautioning countries at country level and while fighting the private sector who has a stake and the interest in uh, providing service as underwriter. Uh, so I'm just telling you that uh, we, we are actually uh, also helping countries at country level, giving you some of the examples. Thanks. Well, thank you. Let's, let's, come, um, let's come to the questions from, from the audience. Um, and I have two so far, so I would encourage um, everyone, if you have more questions, ask. now I think we have about 20 minutes left for the session. So we have a time for a few more questions. And you, Finn, you just mentioned the underwriters. Actually, the, the first question went exactly into this direction. It came, came from Miriam van der Stichele, and it was about um, the question was about if private creditor groups, if they would be able to undermine um, or block in a direct way um, progressive debt resolutions within the UNCTAD or the United Nations as a whole. What 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 the question about the influence of of private sector lobby groups and private creditor lobby groups. Um, is of course you see we have a political audience here so this is um, this is uh, one question the second is coming from from Wolfgang Obenland it's related to the special drawing rights um UNCTAD has been obviously in, back in 1972 I just learned one of the first institutions that made made recommendations on how to use them in progressive ways and in proactive ways um if UNCTAD should be the space where this discussion is going to be picked up now and um yeah, and this Ubuntu is the space where we should basically talk about what to do with the, with the recent um, special drawing rights location. Who likes to start? Any volunteers? Anahi, you want to perhaps take the one with the private creditors? <laughs> Okay, absolutely. I can do that. So first, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of explain a little bit how the kind of process works of the communique, just in case um, not everybody in the audience is aware of, of how kind of a text is negotiated. Basically, um, as countries, you first negotiate with regional groups. So for instance, Argentina negotiates with the G77. And then the G77 chair negotiates on behalf of every country that is part of that group um, to kind of discuss the UNCTAD communique. Of course, as a country can also kind of directly interject and there are kind of focal points and more complexities. Uh, but the reason why I'm explaining this is because the communique as such is of course um, kind of drafted by member states. That being said, of course, that does not close the door for uh, kind of external influences. 
And I think we've seen in the past how effective private uh, creditors can be in blocking different forms of uh, reform in international debt architecture. Um, and I think, for instance, the last uh, kind of very vivid example of this is in the kind of at the turn of the century, the whole debate on, you know, whether to introduce uh, or establish uh, some debt restructuring mechanism versus kind of contractual improvements. I think that the fact that we have contractual improvements, which, as I said, uh, in kind of uh, my first intervention, we definitely think are um, progress. I think that in a way is kind of a success of private sector lobby groups. So I think that uh, they realized that the most uh, efficient way of killing something they didn't want at all was to offer an alternative that was um, better from their perspective and that kind of um, captured their interests better. So um, to kind of round up my answer, I guess, um, in one way, the communique is member-led and it is going to reflect kind of the best compromise of members. On the other hand, and kind of in the more real politics sense, clearly uh, that does not keep private creditors from being able to exert influence. Yeah, Thank maybe you. I can come in if I may, Bordeaux. Sure, go yeah. ahead, please. Yeah. yeah, I think the uh, private sector, they, they do have huge lobbying power. If you talk about the credit rating agencies, we know uh, back in 1990s, uh, the uh, SEC in the United States already proposed reform proposals relating to the credit rating agencies, uh, but uh, there, there, there was a tremendous resistance from the credit rating agencies and they, they were on a strike. So in the end, even the, the government agency had to back down from the reform proposal and they, they gave uh, the, the kind of timeline which year it should start to take effect. But because of the lobbying power, it, it never did uh, take effect. And now we are still talking about the reform of the credit rating agencies, especially, especially now with DSASI and common framework, we know we run into uh, problems with the credit rating agency, but if you want to do away this kind of resistance, for instance, uh, what if we have a moratorium of uh, credit rating, which means during times of global crisis, the credit rating should be put on hold, like uh, servicing debt. Uh, of course, uh, you know, this kind of thing, you, you, you would need to get, get the kind of support of the credit rating agencies and the uh, private sector, and um, uh, they, they would not uh, really support that. Uh, and the same with uh, the DSSI and Common Framework, we know so far there is no private sector participation. Even there is a lot of encouragement uh, and uh, a moral suasion, uh, nothing has happened. So uh, I would say that the private sector still holds uh, a lot of power, uh, which why we need a political will if we want to uh, really uh, successfully and effectively uh, introduce any reform. Uh, may I just uh, in two, sentence, uh, two sentences touch upon the uh, SDR uh, allocation. Uh, I think UNTAD uh, certainly has the, the, the right to discuss the um, uh, allocation of uh, uh, SDR and also the kind of fixed mechanism for the future recycling of unused SDR. But of course, UNCAD is not one of the agencies uh, agreed or designed, uh, designated by the IMF agreement. There are 15 financial institutions which have the power and uh, right to uh, handle the recycling. Of course, UNCTAD is not a financial institution, but it doesn't mean that UNCTAD cannot uh, give opinions, suggestions, policy recommendations uh, relating to SDR for uh, reallocation. Uh, for instance, this time during the crisis, we know 
the push and the advocacy by UNCTAD uh, requesting for a new allocation of SDR, I think supported by other institutions, uh, have so far taken effect. Thank you. Thanks. So actually, I, I take it that there is indeed a severe um, private credit, uh, private <laughs> sector lobby influences on international processes, which is a bit shocking. And nice. but this also tells me that I think CSOs play an important role as as watchdogs of such such activities and also as as a force to counter such activities. So that's that's good. And then yeah, on on the SDRs, I, I do agree. This is I think at the moment the question of rechanneling it is it is actually key also for us as civil society organizations. And UNCTAD is indeed a good place where it could be taken forward. Atia, you also opened, you already opened your mic. Um, I would like to give you the floor in a second. I'm just going to read out one question that came in. Perhaps you can um, include it already in your response. It came from Aldo Cagliari, who could actually also read it out himself or speak himself because he is in the, here in the Zoom group. But um, it is about the G20 common framework that it looked like a common, like a positive step in the beginning. Um, but it didn't achieve much. Of, uh, it didn't achieve anything now after a year, basically. And um, the question is basically, if it if it's running out of time, and um, what what next? What what what? How how our visions? How should a new debt relief initiative look like um, beyond the common framework? Basically, um, this is one question. And but yeah, you're free also to respond to the previous ones. Uh, thank you, Bodo. I, I keep I keep thinking of three words when we talk about lobbying, and actually that was what was going to my mind when when um, when we were speaking. And one is financialization, and the other one is commodification, and the third one is speculation. And when I'm looking at lobbying systems, um, what I tend to see is, of course, is the formal and the informal. And the formal ones are obviously more obvious, and of course, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the informal. Um, and the informal come in in so many ways, but very often I, I tend to think it, it's a theory. I tend to think that when these three are very strong, when you have a lot of speculation, a lot of commodification, and a lot of financialization in a system, you tend to have much stronger uh, lobby groups that come in from private sector and when these three start to interact more and more it tends to destabilize systems in developing countries where the lobby groups tend to be much much stronger in the private sector because they have so much more to lose there is so much less regulation in those three spaces and and i think that that's really what what i wanted to add to the conversation um i will allow someone else to respond on the common agenda at this point i'd like to hear others first Well, though, if I may jump in very quickly on sure, uh, no. yep. the follow-up yes. question on the common framework and also kind of, I think, UFN's excellent points on the role of credit rating agencies, etc. Um, I think first, if we uh, kind of are talking about credit rating agencies and kind of the common framework versus the DSSI um, and the role of kind of private sectors in both of these initiatives, uh, we need to be clear that they are kind of two very different kinds of initiatives, right? So uh, beyond the fact that while the DSSI is suspension and is temporal, uh, et cetera, um, it also didn't explicitly um, ask private sectors to, uh, private sector creditors to engage. So it was a voluntary call, uh, but it wasn't um, kind of binding in any way. Uh, in kind of sharp contrast, the common framework does expect uh, comparable treatment from private sector creditors. Um, and that obviously is kind of a um, double-edged sword because on the one hand, uh, we all want the private sector to participate. On the other hand, it does create the risk that if the agreement with the private sector doesn't follow the agreement with kind of bilateral official um, creditors, um, it might be the end of the kind of whole agreement, right? Um, and credit rating agencies' role is also different because with the DSSI, kind of despite initial uh, kind of noise with regards to kind of downgrades only because of kind of countries applying to the SSI. Um, at the end of the day, they weren't really kind of real downgrades only for the kind of participation in the bilateral kind of public official initiative, precisely because the private sector wasn't involved. And now the common framework is different because the common framework expects the participation of private sectors. So what we're seeing is that um, once countries apply, there are downgrades. And that, of course, is a massive disincentive for countries to apply to the common framework. And I think that kind of to then answer the question of uh, what do we, Alo's question on what do we think kind of uh, happens to the common framework if it's still kind of um, 
salvageable in any way for what can come next. I think, um, despite of the shortcomings that I've mentioned in, in my initial remarks, the common framework um, is progress and it is something that was reached in kind of very arduous negotiations with all of kind of the G20 member states. And it shouldn't be underestimated how important it is to bring non Paris Club members and uh, kind of from the G20 and Paris Club members together on the same table. Um, and I think that um, we will have to kind of try to make the initial cases work. And hopefully that will incentivize kind of a few more applications. Um, and obviously, kind of the uh, proof of the uh, pie is in the eating. So we'll wait and see. But I would be careful in kind of um, calling the initiative dead or anything close to it because it has a kind of tremendous potential and is important despite its limitations. There's one more question. Um, let me throw this straight at you, Anahi, because you just talked about the. When we, I mean, obviously, a common framework DSSI are for low income countries, basically, which is obviously not um, Argentina, for instance, is not a low income country, so it's not eligible for any of those. But also, many Caribbean countries, SITs are not eligible because they have extremely high debt levels, but they are not, not leaks. And the question is, um, to what extent we should consider a multilateral vulnerability index or what 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 to, to what extent should debt relief should be based on more criteria just i mean on criteria which basically go beyond just low income and on vulnerability i think it's a big discussion so what's what's your opinion on this so argentina has been a long advocate for these initiatives not to be exclusively um kind of catered uh, for EDA countries and so uh, that's kind of no secret and um, and in terms of, kind of indexes or other ways of assessing eligibility that's something that um clearly at this stage for these two initiatives is kind of too late uh, but which we definitely consider absolutely central so for instance linking this back to the discussion on SDRs and SDRs rechanneling that is still a kind of an open discussion and there for instance it would be absolutely central in our opinion to um, not only make it kind of income based but basically need based so if a country can demonstrate that they need the liquidity and um, it should be able to kind of be eligible for the rechanneling of SDRs. Uh, so that's something that, that we're definitely in favor of. Great, thank you. So uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our session slowly. And there was one, one question actually already asked in the beginning, but it was a good one to be the closing question, basically, which is why I'm, I'm reading it now. Or I'm asking, uh, posing this question now. And it was basically the question that's for all three of you. What are the three elements you would like to see in a civil society declaration coming out of UNCTAD 15? So obviously we're closing the UNCTAD civil society from tomorrow, uh, basically to today with, 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 with our joint declaration. Um, so just, I mean, obviously you mentioned many good policy recommendations, many, you addressed many of the big problems. You went specifically also into the, into the role that UNCTAD should play. Um, if you would summarize of you were supposed to prioritize what are the three things you want would want to see in such a declaration? And so let's let's do it to a tabla. Perhaps Yifen, you'd like to start. Well, uh, uh, well, I I just talk about the the things that come to my mind first, and I see as important. Uh, I think it will be really really important to reaffirm. Uh, the important role UNCTAD has played for uh, reflecting and defending the interests of developing countries. And it is welcome to have a multilateral institution uh, with this kind of uh, perspective and approach. And then uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the, that is uh, the uniqueness of uh, the UNCTAD as an UN uh, department or institution, whatever you want to call. Uh, uh, another important thing is to talk about uh, at uh, the current time, we are not yet post-pandemic uh, uh, post, uh, yet, uh, but uh, we are uh, at a very challenging, challenging time which we need a stronger uh, UNCTAD uh, in order to allow the developing countries 
to recover uh, better, uh, build back better BBB, uh, or if you want also to mention uh, more uh, in a in more inclusive, uh, greener, uh, and more resilient. And then I would hope uh, to emphasize because of this debt issue, uh, each time it, it is a headache. Uh, for uh, the debt conference in Nairobi, it was the same on Tide 14. So I hope there would be a sentence to to uh, appreciate uh, a, uh, the on Tide mandate to work on debt and financial issues, including on the international financial systemic reform. I hope because. Uh, let's hope in the future, next uh, conference on 10, eight, uh, 16, you wouldn't have to once again struggle about debt issues. Uh, that is uh, the focal point in the, the, in the UN system, uh, after all. And debt is an important issue for developing countries. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think these are. I mean, definitely st points strongly backed by the by the by the CSOs and uh, that have organized this event today or backing this event. Well, over to you, Atia. What what would you suggest? Thank you very much. Well, in addition to what you Finn said, um, I think there's a need to strengthen strengthen the limb between iff debt and human rights i think that is quite critical for me um from from an unctad perspective especially because we're talking about developing countries so i think it's quite clear um we're quite joined on that issue um but there's there's an african proverb that says that um poverty without debt is wealth and I think it's so important because we are talking about debt moratoriums, we are talking about forgiveness uh, to a large extent. And I think we always look at wealth as growth and development, but really we need we need people to just not have debt. So, you know, for me, poverty without debt is wealth is, is a second really big take home um, for me. And the third is the need for a fairer and more um, resilient um, trading system overall broadly um, with UNCTAD playing a very key role in it together with all the other UN agencies. Thank you. Those are my three points. Great. Thank you. And well, indeed, the point on the human, of course, the point on human rights is also um, e extremely important. It should also be noted that there are indeed, of course, two organizations in Geneva that work on debt issues. Basically, that is not just the UNCTAD, but also the Human Rights Council, that, that the cooperation between the two is strengthened is also, I think, a key priority for, for the CSO community and that the human rights, that, well, that the human rights topics also feature in the UNCTAD's work. Um, last but not least, Anai, what are your three points? I think I'll kind of pick up one that was already mentioned, which is kind of a very general point, namely kind of the clear mandate for UNCTAD to work on in the international debt architecture. Um, I think my second point more specifically would be kind of the importance of continue working on uh, the level playing field I mentioned. So I think it is absolutely crucial that uh, during negotiations, debtors and creditors of all kinds um, have uh, kind of do that against the backdrop of a level playing field and also have kind of similar resources to their disposal. And then thirdly, I absolutely love UFN's point on kind of the importance of credit rating agencies. So I think that would be my kind of third point to round up my list. Okay, great. So the, I think there's now a lot of, lot of material for our drafting group to, to, <laughs> to consider when, the, when, we fin when we finalize the CSO statement. Um, I'm well. I'm. I'm. Have to thank you all for participating today in in in, in our in our side event. I think it was a great discussion. It was great to have you. It was um, good to have, well, so so many perspectives, so much expertise. Um, obviously, I mean, obviously, I mean, the, the negotiations are still ongoing on the UNCTAD 15. I think it's now. I, I think compared to to Nairobi, we we there, there's been agreement on a lot of paragraphs already, but. A few of the key paragraphs, and I think, and I understand, especially the very operational one, the number 112, which defines the UNCTAD mandate for the four or five years very specifically, is still open. So I hope we can act, at least we can see a lot of progress still in the coming weeks, and that we can see, well, that also civil society start, continues to push also beyond this forum for for more progress. It's not a it's not an easy time for us, of course, as CSOs also because UNCTAD 15 takes place virtually. 
I remember myself and others running around in Nairobi on, on, on the UN compound, basically, and trying to, to work with delegations, trying to influence last minute the outcome of the, of the, of the, of the conference. This is going to be, quite, I'm still not sure how, we, how we're going to do that next week, basically, with all the virtual formats and this new, this new way of WhatsApp diplomacy, which is not very transparent and accessible, obviously. But I, I hope, well, well I think we, we all need to work hard till the last minute to see that we got a strong UNCTAD mandate and through a strong UNCTAD basically, of course, I mean, better solution to that crisis as we all discussed today. And with this, yeah, I would like to thank you all for participating. And um, I, yeah, I think this was also the last side event of the UNCTAD 15 CSO form. It was for me, it was a very, very great, very informative, very entertaining form. So thanks, thanks again to the organizers, to, to CPDC from the Caribbean. And yeah, and I look forward also to see the final CSO declaration. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.